All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us this morning. If you would like to stand up and, uh, and join us as we enter into worship this morning. Psalm 29 says, The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Good morning, church. How is everybody? Good morning. Doing good? It's good to be back. A um, couple things before I get into all of the, um, the announcements. There's, I was um, having some coffee this morning and I looked outside and, you know, we're in fall and it's like my favorite time of the year and um, looking at the leaves change and then I had this, this analogy that kind of popped into my head and I was thinking about, geez, look at the leaves, right? They, they, they're green, they're lush. And then they start to change during the, the fall foliage season. And then they, they die and then they fall off, right? I said, what an image of my hair, <laughs> right? It's like, 
It's like, right, it starts to gray, and then, you know, so if you're graying, just, you're in fall foliage season, right? And when you're me, you hit peak, okay? So that's kind of, you know, where I was at, but um, <laughs> I don't know where that came from this morning. It did, and I'm like, I've got to run with it. So um, the other thing I was thinking of is that I've been away for probably a, almost a few months now, and I had a pretty significant shoulder surgery, and... Uh, one of the things that I was thinking about was was the relation to my faith, right? And my, my um, the moment that I was saved, because there were points after the surgery, you know, in my own pride, I've had a lot of surgeries in my life, unfortunately, and I've always bounced back, you know, always bounced back. And, um, you know, this one, it was like, you know, two, three weeks went by and nothing. I was down um, a month, two months, I was basically losing hope, right? Um, like, this was a mistake. I should have never have done this. Um, like, is this ever going to get better? I just, I couldn't see beyond the discomfort and the pain that I was in, um, the lack of sleep that I was getting. And then all of a sudden, just like a week and a half ago, there was this one night I slept and I, I'm like, oh, thank God, right? And I, I immediately equated that to life. Like I was living without hope in this one area of my life. And there were people living without hope in their entire lives, right? Um, just as I was. And then that moment I found Christ, we had, I had hope. And um, it's like an immediate thing. And so I just, you know, just try and encourage everybody. If you're, you're in one of those places, just... Um, you know, keep plugging away and, and keep searching the Lord and, and um, you'll find hope. So anyways, I uh, just wanted to share that. And um, if you're visiting with us today, it's great to have you. Um, if you'd like to know a little bit more about Hope in Christ Church, please pick up a visitor's packet. They're out um, in the lobby and take that with you. And, you know, feel free to um, take a look at that. And if you have any questions, see one of the elders or Pastor Steve. Um, in the front of uh, your seats, in the back of the seats, there is a... Um, connect card. Um, you can use those to be added to our email list or our praying, um, prayer chain, and you can drop those off in the wooden boxes um, in the back or as you're leaving the, um, the building. Um, and please just let us know in there like how we might be able to serve you. And if you're watching us online, um, you know, obviously, please feel free to reach out to us, email us, stop by the office. Um, you know, we'd love to be able to um, serve you as well. So, um, couple of things to, to go over from um, an offering perspective. This year we have been extremely blessed um, by all of you faithful givers, so thankful for that and thank you for that. Um, we're not passing around the offering baskets, but uh, we do have, as I mentioned, the offering um, boxes in the back of the sanctuary and as you're leaving the building, um, or you can give online. If you're visiting with us today, um, please do not feel obligated to give. We are supported by our members um, and our regular attendees. Um, and we're just happy that you're here with us. Um, along the line of giving, one of the, um, the, the funds that we have is our deacon fund. Um, and the deacon's fund is used um, to help those that might have a financial need. And um, we want to be able to help you if there's an area that we can. Um, so if, there's, if you do have a need, please see one of the, the deacons um, or one of the elders. Um, for direction there. But we'll be having a special collection next week for the Deacons Fund. Um, so if you're led to give there in that area, um, we'll be having a collection just for um, where the proceeds will all go into the Deacons Fund to help others within, um, within the body. Um, a few reminders. October 21st, um, there's a Cornerstone 101 Church um, Ambassador event that's going to be held here. Um, on Friday the 21st from 6.30 to 8.30, um, and all encouraged to come. This is an event designed to inspire um, us with a biblical rationale and to equip us with the practical tools we need to effectively engage with elected officials regarding today's hottest cultural topic. So that sounds very interesting. So if you're able to, um, you know, please join us for that. Um, October 22nd, um, Saturday at 8 a.m., there'll be a men's breakfast. So you can use the link that's in your bulletin, um, or you can sign up online. Um, the Wednesday night ministries are back in full swing, so it's been great to, to start that and see everybody on Wednesday nights again. And we still need some help for volunteers in the nursery. 
um, Awana and youth group. So if you're able to um, and you're willing, please um, you know, consider doing that. Um, we also have um, Pastor Steve is going to be holding uh, open office hours from 6.30 to 8. So um, if you have uh, a need to talk with uh, Pastor Steve about something, he'll be available during those hours. Um, speaking of volunteers, we could still use some help with Kids Church um, teachers or helpers. Um, so, you know, please see Cheryl if, if you're willing to help out um, as, a, as a helper or as a teacher. If I can do it, you can do it. Um, so please reach out to Cheryl if, um, if you're desired to help out there. And then um, we do have a new Help Wanted out in the lobby. Um, if you want to grab that, if you're just thinking about how can I serve, you can grab the Help Wanted packet from out back. And um, we'll be having a new members class again soon. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, who we are, um, uh, please see one of the elders, um, and they'd be happy to talk to you about um, you know, getting signed up for that. And again, there's no obligation to become a member there, just to take a little bit of time to, for you to learn about us and us to learn a little bit more about you. And if you're thinking about getting baptized or a baby dedication, or maybe you just have questions about what that is all about, uh, please uh, find Pastor Steve. He'll be happy to talk to you about that. Wednesday night, 6 to 30 will be a great time, right? <laughs> Um, we have um, Wednesday morning Bible study with Jeff and Carol Owen. Um, that's at 10 a.m. here. There is no child care. Young adult group is on every Friday from um, 6.30 p.m. for ages 18 to 28 if you're looking to plug in somewhere. And um, then there's a uh, small group at Pastor Steve and Cheryl's house on Sundays from 5 to 7. All right, let's go to prayer. Father God, we are so blessed um, that we live in a place that we can freely gather together to worship you. We live in a time where everything just feels like everything's against you and what you stand for. And we ask for your strength as we seek to be light in the darkness. We know this is a confusing and challenging place right now, especially for our children and young adults. Um, and you call upon all of us as parents, aunts, uncles, friends, grandparents, to be positive influences in their lives. So, Lord, please grant us the courage and the words to be graceful and loving to them as we look to guide them closer to you. Please help us clear our minds of all the outside distractions um, and let us have you be our focus this morning so that you may speak to our hearts. Please be with Pastor Steve as he delivers his message and that his words might not be of his own, but of you. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you please stand if you're able and join us as we go we continue in an attitude of worship. Uh, Romans 6.6 6 says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. <laughs>
Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. morning. Oh. Uh, something that we've been doing here uh, pretty often, uh, once a month, we set aside a time similar to our uh, missions moment. We have a ministry moment, and um, our ministries, or a good portion of them, are listed on that help wanted ad that we have in the foyer, giving you an opportunity to exercise the gifts that God has given you. And um, this week, a ministry that's dear to my own heart is the SWAT team. And I'm gonna read you just what's written here and then we'll talk a little bit about particulars. Is how many churches have their own SWAT team? Well, we do, it's the Sunday Worship Operations Team. And it's a dedicated group that's able to come almost every Sunday. Uh, they prepare the bulletins, communion elements, um, the visitor and kids' church folders, they welcome visitors, introduce parents to the children's church teachers, and deal with just about everything that happens on a Sunday. Maybe they'll show up a little bit early and, and shovel a little snow or uh, take care of the lights when they're flickering or just anything that um, 
we do on Sunday. They work closely with the pastor, elders, worship leader, and uh, the tech team providing assistance where it's needed. And it's a combination of ministries you might already be familiar with that would, could be known as welcomers or greeters or ushers or a safety team. Um, and if that's something that you can do, um, we have a job for you. Come and see me. Uh, this church does a great job of welcoming new people, and uh, many people have pointed it out to me. So if you can walk that fine line between uh, cold and creepy, uh, <laughs> which is hard to do, if you know what I mean. If you've ever been new to a church, you know that you know sometimes you can be surrounded and feel a little uncomfortable, and sometimes you can feel... Um, like you're totally outside of the whole big picture. So if you can walk that line, let me know, because it's something that we really uh, work hard at, um, is to make people feel welcome here. And um, that's really, you know, pretty much all there is to it, because Robbie Shaw and Tommy are both out today, right? Tommy's not here? So um, right now, so we could use somebody else because those two are, are essential elements of our, uh, of our team. They're the ones that run to the end of the hallway and lock the corridor door, so that might not be locked right now. Uh, it, thank you very much. Um, and also Rita does a great job um, with us on that team, um, welcoming people. She walks that fine line. She's not cold or creepy. And, uh, and, John, and, and uh, John and Mike Taylor both uh, work with us on that team. So if you want to join us and just help us out on what we do on Sundays, please let me know. And next month we will be featuring another ministry that you might be uh, gifted and feel led to join. A um, couple of things before we dismiss the kids. I, I answered that question that you've all been asking yourself again last week. Can Pastor Steve preach a 15-minute sermon. No, <laughs> he can't. I hit 18 minutes when uh, Yesopotam was here, and, and last week um, went a little bit over 20. Uh, I, I guess it just can't be done. I, I, I don't know. Um, I tried. That was my goal. Um, and as you were here last week, you know, I get a little wound up. When I speak on the holiness of God, um, personally, it's been something that um, has deepened my relationship um, with God over the years. And it, was, uh, it began all many years ago. And I just wanted to share with you that book um, that really kind of changed how I looked at a lot of scripture. And I would recommend it to any Christian, um, R.C. Sproul's Holiness of God. And uh, I, I would put that on a must read for every Christian, along with the Pursuit of God by Tozer and Basic Christianity by Stott. But, but that's, that's really something that everybody should. It's six bucks on eBay. I looked that up this morning. Um, used, if you don't mind used books. I don't. So um, there's that. A uh, couple of things this week I learned. And I know you guys get a hoot out of me learning things, New Hampshire things. Uh, log splitters are not for sissies. All right. Um, I've been carrying that with me for years, and I got my first log splitter, and I, that's, I'm good with it. No more disparaging remarks about people that use a machine to split wood. And um, you eat the loaded cheesy bacon fries after you go on the tilt a whirl. <laughs> That was another thing I learned this last week. So um, I'm getting the New Hampshire thing. Um, also, we got a great uh, heartfelt thanks from Teen Challenge. Um, so they really appreciated your, your, your uh, encouragement and your prayers and your, uh, your generous gifts. So I got that in the mail just uh, a couple of days ago. So at this time, we can get our little cherubs off to their classrooms. Get them signed in, and uh, the rest of you can stretch your legs for a second and say, shake hands with somebody you don't know. Say hi. But remember, don't be cold and creepy or creepy.
we doing with the kids? We got our kids pretty well settled in here. It seems dark up here. No? Maybe it's my old eyes. Sure, the lights all the way up. <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> no, that's all right. It's okay. Oh, they are brighter. Thank you very much. Um, so. Uh, at this time, if you, if you have your outlines and your pens and your Bibles ready, um, ready to go, if you're missing any of those three things, there's pens and Bibles right by the door right there, and there's outlines in the spare bulletins out in the foyer. Um, we finished up last week with Hannah's great prayer of worship, and I hope that it inspired you. Um, I hope that it helped you understand the biblical foundation for worship and prayer. I got a lot out of putting that together. And um, I, I hope that you just got a little bit of what I got out of it. It was, it, it was really good for me to go through that last week because, uh, you know, we can do things just because that's how we've always done them. Um, and that's not a really good routine to get into when we have God's word right here. So it's good to kind of start from scratch sometimes. Uh, this week we're going to be looking at more communication between God and man. But this time we're going to be talking about God communicating to us. So if you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 11, we'll get going on that. While you find your place there, um, I'll share a story with you. It might illuminate the message a little better. It's about a guy named Lester, and he was somebody about my age, who was, began to get tired of having to constantly repeat himself when he was speaking to his wife. Science fiction, right? So he called the doctor to have a hearing test scheduled for her. And the doctor said, yeah, I can see her in a couple of weeks. But meanwhile, here, there's a simple informal test that you can give her. And you can let me know how it works out so I can be prepared for this meeting. Here's what you do. You start about 40 feet away from her. And you, when she's facing away from you, speak in a normal conversational tone. And if she, she hears you, that's fine. But if not, move to 30 feet and, and, and talk to her again while her back is turned and see if she hears it. And if she doesn't hear that, try 10 feet. And if that doesn't work, walk right up behind her and talk to her and see if she can hear that. Just keep getting closer until you get a response. So that evening, he walked over to the other side of the house. About 40 feet away. And he said, honey, what's for supper? No response. He moves 10 feet closer and repeats, honey, what's for supper? Nothing. 20 feet, honey, what's for supper? No response. 10 feet, honey, what's for supper? She didn't even answer. He walks right up behind her and says, honey, what's for supper? Just, she says, for the fifth time, it's chicken. <laughs> you see, Lester's wife was not hard of hearing at all. He, he wasn't listening. It was him. Right? It's the same principle we're going to be looking at here today. And the same principle that some Christians and all non-Christians face. They're not with our husbands or our wives, but our desire to hear God. Right? It's not unusual for me as a pastor to hear people say things like that. I don't hear God speaking to me. Or, or I don't hear God speak to me the way he used to when my faith was fresh. I don't know what's going on in my life. Or they lay blame on God who seems to have abandoned them. Or maybe because they don't hear from God, he must not exist. Or if he does, it's impossible to get to know him. Right? But none of those scenarios are because God doesn't speak. It's because we refuse to listen. And that's the main principle we're going to see here today. God still speaks, but many refuse to listen. And this is the third, 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 third sermon in this series, so just a bit of background if you're visiting. Um, we're following the story of Samuel, and, and as I, I called this series uh, in the book of 1 Samuel, uh, Priest, Prophet, Kingmaker. After Moses led the Jews out of Egypt, 
right? Joshua took over, led them to the land God had promised them. They settled there, but before God established a, a king there, right? It was the time of the judges. It was a time when the, the people would, you know, uh, do what was right in their own eyes. And they'd get into this all kinds of problems and they'd, God would rescue them through a judge. They'd promise to never do it again, but then they would. And it was this big cycle uh, that went on for, I think, 1,100 years. And we're right at the end of that, right before God established kings in Israel. And it's when um, God raises up this man named Samuel. And Samuel was born as a result of God's work in the life of this wonderful woman of faith called Hannah. And at three years old, according to his mother's vow, Samuel was left at the tabernacle, right? That's the temporary and portable temple, right? And he's left in the care of the high priest Eli, where Samuel would begin his own training as a priest. So let's take a look at the scripture here. 1 Samuel 2, 11. And Elkanah, that's um, Samuel's father, went home to Ramah. And the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. Now, the sons of Eli were worthless men. They didn't know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the peoples, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling and with a three-pronged fork in his hand, he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. And all that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites that came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servants would come and say to the man who was sacrificing Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat, but, but only raw. And if the man said to him, let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, no, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus, the sin of the young men was great in the sight of the Lord. For the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed in a linen ephod, his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she has asked of the Lord. And then they would return to their home. And indeed, the Lord visited Hannah and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. The boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli was very old. And he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent meetings. And he would say to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of God to put them to death. For the boy Samuel, now the boy Samuel continued to grow in both stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, thus says the Lord, did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt, subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the peace of pe people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest part of every offering? Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me I shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. Then in distress you will look with an envious eye on all the prosperity that shall be bestowed upon Israel, and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. The only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out and to grieve his heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. And this shall not come upon, this shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. They shall be in the sight of you. Both of them shall die on the same day, and I will raise up for myself a faithful priest 
who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he will go in and out before my anointed forever. And everyone who is left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver, a loaf of bread, and say, please, put me in one of the priest's places that I may eat a morsel of bread. That was a long, a long one. But there's no way to split that up. I want to add just a bit of commentary um, to each of these characters to add a little bit of depth of our story. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli. Eli's the, the, the high priest, and these guys were wicked men, it says. Literally, it uses the word Belial. Um, it's a term reserved for Jewish people who are considered worthless because they openly disregarded the law. It wasn't just that they disregarded it. They did it in view of everybody. Paul uh, used it in 2 Corinthians as a synonym for Satan. So this is a serious indictment of these two. And they don't even know God. They don't even believe. And the reason it's so horrible is because they served in the temple. The official worship service that took place in the tabernacle, they were, they were uh, as sons of the high priest, right? They were in the line of Levi. So thus, they were at least that much qualified to carry out the various duties of day-to-day running of the tabernacle and its furnishings, right? That's uh, in Numbers 3. Their, sight, their, their sin was very great in the sight of the Lord. Right? They treated the offering with contempt. Right? The Jewish people are bringing their offerings to God in worship, and these two are treated their own, like their own little candy store. Plus, they either seduce, raped, or use their authority to coerce the women serving there to have sexual relations with them. Right? This is in, in, in contrast, a couple of contrasts in here. In, in verses 18 to 21, he talks about Samuel. He brings us back this picture of what it should look like. Right? Samuel was serving according to the law. He was obeying the law's requirements for priests, and that's what it's talking about, the ephod. Okay? That, that's what it talks about uh, in the law of, of what the priests were supposed to be wearing. And he's part of a family that's dedicated to the Lord. Right? You... Eli, the high priest, unwilling to hold his sons accountable for what they were doing. Although, a couple of weeks ago, he didn't hesitate to call Hannah a drunk for pouring out her heart in emotional prayer. He has a little bit of a different standard for his sons, doesn't he? And that last character is the unknown prophet who shows up to confront Eli with a, thus says the Lord. You know, throughout these verses, God's speaking. He's speaking in a lot of different ways to a lot of different people. What we're going to look at here today is how Hophni, Phinehas, and Eli are refusing to listen. And we're going to be looking at at, at, uh, God speaking next week as well, but we're going to be talking about how we do listen. But this is kind of what not to do this week. And then next week's kind of like part two, what to do. Um, so let's take a look at how God speaks and how these three, three are refusing to listen and how we might be just a touch hard to hear and sometimes ourselves. The first thing that we see here, that God speaks to his children through his spirit. Right? In the Old Testament, right, the Holy Spirit was delivered by God to certain people for a certain purpose for a certain period of time. Okay, like our unnamed prophet in verses 27 um, through 36. The prophet's called by God to bring his exact words to those that God wants to hear those words. Right? That's Old Testament prophecy. So when he says, thus says the Lord, that's exactly what's going on there. God is speaking to Eli through the Holy Spirit by the agency of that prophet. But Eli refuses to listen. By that, I mean he doesn't take heed of it. He doesn't obey it. He says, yeah, whatever. And we see the result. God proclaims that Eli and his sons will be removed from ministry. And the sons, they're going to be removed altogether on the same day. God is saying through the Holy Spirit, if you're not going to listen to me, I'm not going to use you. You think he'd say something like that today? Betcha. But the dynamics have changed a little bit. God hasn't changed. He still speaks through the Holy Spirit, but now the Holy Spirit dwells in each and every believer. And Jesus says, I've used this, you know, 
I'll use it every week. It's just so convicting to me. You know, Jesus said, when I leave, the Holy Spirit will come, and it's going to be an advantage to you. An advantage over having Jesus right next to you. And when the Spirit of truth comes, I'm kind of grabbing some verses out of John 16. Um, when the Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. John 16 is a great place to go uh, to understand the Holy Spirit speaking. But you have to listen if you want to serve God. And it may not be the audible words that came to Eli, but they're no less God speaking. When he calls you to faith and repentance and gives you new life, God is saying to you, I love you. When he gives you spiritual gifts to serve him with, he's saying, I want you to work with me. When he strengthens you to serve with him, he's saying, you can do this. When he purifies you for service, he's saying, I want your full devotion. When you experience the peace of his presence, he's saying, calm down, I got this. When he gives you direction and guidance, he's saying, let's go this way, it's going to be great. When he gives you assurance and courage in conflict, he's saying, stay firm, this is important. When he gives you an unshakable sense of his presence, he's saying, you're not alone. I'm right here with you. And when he leads you to scripture and illuminates what it means and how it works in your life, he's saying, this is what you need today. And that's really a point of its own, and that's where we're going next. God speaks to his children through his word. Oop, a double click. Oh, oh, there we go. As a priest, and then, and then, and then as, as he was promoted a high priest, Eli had been through exhaustive training according to the law, God's word. God's word was very, very, very specific about everything to do with the tabernacle and then the temple and the worship. Everything that was done there. So, so Hophni and Phinehas, they also had explicit training according to God's word, right? Um, as an example, right? Leviticus 7, Leviticus 10, Deuteronomy 18, God speaks to exactly what portions of meat the priests are supposed to take. But they refused to listen. They just took what they wanted. I don't want it boiled. I want it raw so I can get that nice little char on it, right? Eli knew that his sons were corrupt. He knew that they didn't know the Lord. He knew what they were supposed to be doing according to what God had spoken, but he refused to listen. You know, and it's easy for us to look at this, you know, this story and say, Oh, how could they be doing that, you know? Well, you know, there's a lot in here for us, too, you know? Are we listening, too? How should we understand God speaking through his word? To corral that, right? Um, 2 Peter 1.19 Right, and again, I've used these things. I've used these verses, you know, a hundred times since I've been here. And we have the prophetic word, God's word, more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in dark place until the day dawns and the morning stars rise in your hearts, knowing, first of all, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Right? All Scripture is theopneustos. God breathed. Profitable for teaching, reproof, and correction, training in righteousness, so that the man of God 
will be equipped, complete, equipped for every good work. Right? I mean, that, those are the two verses that, that capture God's word and how we use it, how we should understand it. Right? Scripture is the inspired words of God brought to us by human authors through the work of the Holy Spirit. It's what God wants us to learn so we're complete and equipped for every good work. Not partly prepared for some work. A hundred percent ready for everything he's prepared for us to serve him and serve people in his name. Right? You're going to see a lot of pushback from this. What Charles Spurgeon called the high view of scripture. I call it the only view of scripture. But you're going to get a lot of pushback against this every way you turn as a Christian today. It's been attacked by non-Christians, by false teachers, by counterfeit Christians since God first spoke to us. That's how quickly this came up. Right? Um, Genesis 3. Adam and Eve. Now the serpent was much more crafty than any other beast in the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, nor shall you even touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you surely won't die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. It didn't take long, did it? For that doctrine to be attacked. As soon as God started speaking, there was somebody there denying it. That's not really what he meant. What he meant was, and it hasn't stopped ever since. We're never short of people who claim that what God has said doesn't need to be listened to from the serpent in the garden or, or Kings 18, that great story of the king of Assyria sending the, the, uh, his army to encircle Jerusalem with that huge army and the general Rabshakeh, I think, calling up to King Hezekiah, don't listen to God, listen to us. Or Acts 7, when Stephen preached the gospel to the Jewish council, but they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and they rushed together at him and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. Same thing. Don't listen to God. Or Christian higher education. I forgot to say it right. Christian higher education today. Right, where celebrity theologians like N.T. Wright say that scripture as God's inerrant word is a 20th century American invention. You get it everywhere you turn. Or by the speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives that says killing the unborn is biblically justified and it's not just a modern version of Baal worship that's condemned by God throughout Scripture. They're all saying the same thing. Don't listen to God. And when it's at its full strength, when what God speaks of as sin is welcomed and celebrated and what some people dare call a church to promote what calls God calls sin like a same-sex marriage in his house it's literally repeating exactly what these three characters have done in here you can lay them right next to each other there's no difference right find the picture difference between these two pictures no difference God is speaking to his children through his word. Has and always will be a foundational belief in Christianity. To deny its inerrancy, its infallibility, its authority, and its sufficiency is to call into question everything we know about Christianity. It's all God spoken. It's all God breathed. If you can't trust in every part of it, then you can't trust in any part of it because you're never going to know what parts are right and what parts are wrong. Right, Dr. Bruce Ware talks about, the, uh, um, talks about it as a, uh, one of the big signs in the airport, you know, that has all the arrivals and the flight numbers and the departures and the times, and you, the guy doesn't see his <clears throat> flight number up there, so he asks the, the flight attendant, um, what's up, you know, with the schedule there? I don't see my flight number. Well, you know, that sign, some of it's right and some of it's wrong. He says, well, what part's right and what's more wrong? She says, well, that's the issue. We don't really know. Well, you know, how much... Time is that guy going to be spent looking at that sign? 
He's not going to look at it at all because he can't tell what's right and what's wrong. And it's the same thing with God speaking. You're in or you're out. So how do we do that? How do we refuse today to listen to God? Right? Well, we decide not to read it. Meh. Right? No right way, no wrong way. You know, I read, I, I read you know, I got a time. You know, it's 6.05. You know, Shirley can do whatever. She makes time every day, but it's not as regimented as me. We're all different. We all need to be in that, listening to God's word. Sometimes we read it and we just don't want to understand it. Sometimes we read it and we understand it, but we don't want to apply it to our lives. And we can fall off this wagon in a lot of different places. Right? Sometimes we read it in a weird way. Right? I mean, we've seen the, the people take the Bible and go... Ah, I wouldn't recommend it. You know, I, I'm not saying God can't use that, but, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I, 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 don't think I'd, I don't think I'd do that very often, if I were you. Just, just me saying. Or, or read it out of context. You know, that's why we preach through the whole books of the Bible here. You can get this foundational understanding of the context that it's written in. You're not jumping around all over the place. God speaks. Yeah, I'll share. I'm going to share a story with you. Um, bringing your kids to church is important, right? You would say yes, um, and that would be correct. But I do know. Um, a family that is struggling right now with um, some of the choices um, that their children are making. And this family has gone to a great church that preaches God's word for years. But what happened was what the children learned was that you can go to the church and you can listen to that great preacher, and he's good, um, but we can come home and act a different way. That's what those parents, that's what those kids learned from their parents. And uh, boy, it, 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 the results of it are devastating right now. It's tough to watch. third thing we see here is God speaks to his children. Yep. You guys. Verse 16 says that some people did try to stand up to the brothers, but they refused to listen. It looks as though Samuel was given a great example of what a priest should be doing, even though he was still in training. They were watching him, but they refused to listen. In verse 22, Eli kept hearing about all that evil that his sons were doing. But he did nothing to stop it because he refused to listen. And when Eli finally confronted his two sons, they refused to listen. God's speaking to a lot of people here, but they're not interested in listening. That's one of the big reasons that he gathers us together like this in a church, in a body. So he can speak to us through each other. Now be careful here. Okay? I'm not talking about bringing new revelation. I'm not, I'm talking, what I'm talking about here is non-perfect words of encouragement and rebuke and direction and correction and love. It can be God speaking. But it's going to be through imperfect people. Right? God's will for all those who have placed their faith in Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and for them to be in a church body. Okay, Acts to Revelation. This Lone Ranger Christian is not a thing. Period. We impact each other. We pray for each other. We teach each other. We encourage each other. We share our lives, our burdens, our joys, our celebrations. We bring scripture to bear onto each other's lives. God speaks like this. We can't refuse to listen to it. God speaks when we share the gospel, when we lead others to Christ. God speaks when we disciple each other 
and people grow in faith. God speaks when we're generous to those in need. God speaks when we forgive people and love our enemies. It's not perfect. It's not infallible. It's not authoritative. And it's not sufficient like scripture. It's not thus says the Lord. It's not someone saying, I have a word from God for you. For me, it's the encouragement, you know, that you get just at the right moment. A great insight I get on a Sunday night when we talk about, you don't even want to know. (laughs) Sunday night. Tonight it's Melchizedek and the priesthood, and who knows where it's going to end up. But you're all welcome. Bring a little something to throw on the grill, and um, you'll have fun. Um, God speaks. God speaks when I get a phone call, you know, four years ago, and saying, Steve, I think there's a church up in New Hampshire might be a good fit. They weren't perfect words, but it was God speaking. God speaks to me through the great examples of Christ-like living that he places around me in people like you. Another way that God speaks that we really need to understand is through his world, right? The world he created. I'll give you a couple examples. Um, one you're probably familiar with, probably one less, but um, Romans 1.18 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened I, I, I see this as God introducing himself to people I really do I, I, I really do um, and, and I use it I introduce people to God like this all the time you know it's much easier in New Hampshire and it's a lot easier this time of year when you could just you know it wasn't a couple weeks ago I I had somebody by the, by the shirt and I pulled them right over to these huge windows and said, look at this. You think this is an accident? I, I, you know, I, it's not. I mean, they can deny it and they can walk away, but God uses it to introduce himself and, and we can use it to introduce God to people all the time. In, in, in theology, it's called general revelation. Um, and it's not just that there's some kind of higher power that you can create in your own image. Right? It's much, much more than that. It's the introduction or unveiling of God to people that reveals the fact that he exists and he's intelligent and he's powerful and he's transcendent. Um, there's another one here. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun. A sunrise. A child's birth. The expanse of the ocean from a dune, right? The, the, the Rocky Mountains, the, the glorious color of the leaves, looking up into the heavens. Um, I see it in weddings and funerals. Experiences that people have that makes them think about the big picture. as general revelation. God is speaking. This is not an accident. I'm here. Look at the glory of my created hand. I mean, this sticks to people, I'm telling you. But it's not a complete introduction, is it? It's just the beginning. It just whets their thirst to know him. It doesn't reveal the path to know him. It just reveals the hunger he's placed in their heart to seek him. Right? It doesn't show the plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. That's a great segue into that most powerful and final way that we see God speaking. God speaks to his children through his son. 
And we can see this by carefully looking at verse 35, although the word, you know, the name Jesus isn't in there, right? I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and she shall go in and out before my anointed forever. Um, the line of faithful uh, Levitical priests, right? A sure house, that line of Levitical priests will um, start again um, through Samuel, and um, they're going to that line of Levitical priests is going to serve eternally. And they will serve him eternally before God's anointed. And you all remember that from last week, right? That's the Hebrew word for Messiah and the Greek word for Christ. The law, the tabernacle, the temple, the priesthood, the workers, the Jewish people, the entire nation of Israel is all God's preparation for the arrival the perfect life, the atoning death, and the supernatural resurrection and ascension of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And that's what we're looking forward to here. That's what this is all about. Genesis to Revelation. The reason for the Old Testament is the New Testament. The reason for the way of the law was the way of faith. Faith in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, the sins that separate us from a perfectly holy God, this is where this is all heading. Faith in Christ that would come to fulfill the law and become the Savior who would all, for all who would repent and believe. That's what we're talking about here. The ultimate form of God speaking to us is the person of Jesus Christ. Um, Hebrews. Hebrews 1. What a way to start a book. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Right? When, when, when Jesus revealed himself at the transfiguration, right, he's working his way back to Jerusalem to offer himself up as a sacrifice for all who would believe. Right, right before that um, is what's known as a transfiguration. And he takes um, John and James and Peter and before him, um, he is seen as the Son of God. He reveals himself. Uh, as the Son of God in what's known as the Transfiguration. And Moses and Elijah are there, and they speak about what's going to happen. And as that ends, God speaks. And he says, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And we have to listen to him. You have to listen to him if you don't know God, but you feel his call. You have to listen to him speak to you through Jesus. Especially when he said things like, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Living without God is not easy. Life is a struggle without God. But he's here speaking to you. He's asking you to come to God through him. Clear up that sin. Let him take the punishment for it. Jesus was very clear in his earthly ministry. Um, John 7, 15 and John 3, 34 and, and a number of other places that when he spoke, it was God speaking through him. God's speaking through all of us here today in that if there are any here that don't know Jesus as their Savior, that you would cast your sins upon him. Let him carry that burden. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would reveal yourself to any here that don't know you. That they would heed your call, they would listen to your voice, 
that you would speak through Christ and that burden of sin that separates them from you would be lifted from them and the light yoke of faith and repentance would be placed upon them. Help us to walk next to them, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we haven't looked at all the different ways that God speaks. Just the ways that Eli and his two sons experienced and refused. Refused to listen. The Bible records God speaking audibly to people. Scripture talks about him speaking in visions and dreams and angels and a donkey, right? So none of this is off the table. But it's certainly evident that it's less common since his written word has been complete. We also need to remember that his written word is the parameters, it's the boundaries of how he speaks in other ways. But any of those other ways will not contradict Scripture. You know, if the clouds parted right now and God's voice boomed out, whatever it said would be in full agreement with what he's offered to us in Scripture. You know, I've heard pastors say, do you want to hear God speak? Read your Bible. You want to hear God speak out loud? Read it out loud. <laughs> Is it correct? Yeah. Is it helpful? No, it's not. Is it a complete understanding of God speaking? No, it's not. Is it helpful for a Christian desperately wanting to hear from God, but he's struggling? No, it's condescending and it's short-sighted. While technically true. But also, what is not helpful, our pastors often up fresh revelation from God that only they can receive and interpret. Right? It puts a knot in my stomach when I hear that. Not that I don't believe that the Holy Spirit, who is God, wants to get my attention through someone else. Not at all. It freaks me out for two reasons. Number one, I've seen it misused many times and, and used as a way to attract attention to themselves. Number two, it's given the presupposition that that word is also inerrant, in, uh, is, is inerrant, infallible, authoritative, and sufficient. And, and third of all, it's, it's, it's not technically true. It's not God's word. At best, it's the Holy Spirit working through a broken, sinful person who might very well mess it up. You know, if God's asking you to bring his word to someone, just say it like that. You know, I really believe that God is impressing upon me through the Holy Spirit for me to spend some more time with you and talk about this issue. What's the matter with that? Or, you know, I, I mean, I don't want somebody to come up to me and say, I had a dream last night and this is what it said you should do. You know, I wouldn't appreciate that. But if somebody came up to me and said, you know what, I had a dream last night. I'd like to talk to you with about it. Um, I'm all in. That's not off the table. This is a fast-paced life that we're living. And we really need to slow down and listen to God speak. It's much more important than the trivial matters that have us running back and forth all over town every day. So finally we're exhausted and we collapse. If you're not hearing God, slow down and listen to him. Ask him to speak. Pray to him. Tell him you're having trouble hearing him speak. Ask him to strip from you whatever in your life is plugging your ears. And submit to his word. Enjoy his family. Serve his body. Love his son. And if you're not hearing from him, if you're not hearing God speak, shut up. <laughs> I mean, I hate to be so blunt, but, you know, sometimes we just holler across the house like Lester. 
you know, demanding answers. And we need to be quiet and listen ourselves. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask you to speak to us, each one of us, in the way that only you know can touch our heart. Help us to submit to those words. Help us to understand how to communicate to others. Help us to purify our lives so we can be of more service. Help us to love you, Lord. Help us to hear you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Goodbye, everybody online. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. I hope we can see you here soon. And um, now we're going to hear Paul Taylor speak. <laughs>